like to um, share with you this afternoon is, is some of our work that we've been doing on uh, biofumigation uh, for the management of PCN, which I was annoyed with myself this morning. I do have a small vial of PCN, quite a few thousand in there, if, if any of you do want to come and have a, have a look at those later on. Uh, and um, so what we're going to do to begin with is we're going to talk about some of the concepts of biofumigation so that we're all clear on what we're trying to achieve. I'm going to hand over to Bill at various points because he's going to talk about um, the process and, and his own work which he's been doing on, on incorporation. Essentially, the process of biofumigation is, is not new. We've known about um, the usefulness of growing brassicas for reducing pests and diseases for some time. And we've looked back on some of the records for, for uh, nematode work particularly and found that actually you can go back to the 1920s and find that growers, agronomists were using these crops to try and get suppression of pests and diseases. And they knew a bit about the, what was going on in terms of the biology and the the, the useful biocidal gases that were being released from these crops. I believe that we probably gave up our interest in this after the war when there was the boom of synthetic products and uh, it was very much a case of Route 1 football that uh, we've got something in a tin that can address the problem. However, as alluded to earlier, matters have changed. We are seeing, seeing uh, products being removed. Um, Part of the biofumigation drive uh, was initially driven by um, the phase-out of methyl bromide. Um, that was really the key um, issue with uh, driving uh, biofumigation um, search forward. So to start with, just to introduce you to the concept, this chap here, this is, this is um, Dr. John Kierkegaard, and he's an Australian, and he is uh, the first a uh, scientist who really described what biofumigation is about. So essentially, it means the suppression of soil-borne pests, weeds and diseases um, by biocidal, which means that they affect everything uh, that's biological, principally isothiocyanates, which are, which are gases released from our brassicas, into the soils when glucosinolates, and glucosinolates are metabolites from these brassic plants, secondary metabolites, um, when they're hydrolyzed by an enzyme called myrosinase, so when they're converted. So what's, what's, what's caused the increase, um, interest in, the, in this? Well, as, as, as indicated, it's, it's changing legislation uh, with uh, crop protection, the phase out of methyl bromide, what's happened in Europe with the um, Authorisation directive being replaced uh, by a, a new directive, which means that uh, we now our criteria is based upon hazard rather than risk, and all crop protection products are hazardous, which makes <coughs> the re-registration of them even more challenging than it was before. The other reason we should be interested in these uh, biofuels is that they do a number of jobs potentially. They may be having an effect on BCN, which is what we're really primarily interested in at Harper. But there is also evidence that they have uh, beneficial effects on weeds and some other important damaging organisms. Thirdly, we're introducing a lot of um, green matter into the soil. And we've got a crop growing at a time we wouldn't normally have a crop growing. So that's helping with nutrient capture and long-term release of nutrients. Also, increasing the organic matter in your soil may well increase uh, microorganisms which are antagonistic to uh, the organisms which cause disease, the pathogens. So, so there are these additional benefits and it fits the idea of biofumigation, fits quite nicely with this concept of, of capital and green and trying to, if we can include biofumigants within that, we can do two jobs at once. So I'm going to hand over to Bill, and Bill is going to describe <coughs> what biofumigation is all about. So the business end of biofumigation, if you like, is accessing those biocidal compounds which are going to act on your target organism. Um, so you can see here, you've got a, a 
photograph of um, plant cross section, and you've got some cells there which have got um, molecules called glucosinolates um, in them. And the glucosinolates are glucose rich um, molecules, and then they have uh, nitrogen, sulfur, and a variable side chain. Basically, the, the sulfur component is, um, is, is where we think that this toxicity is coming from, them being uh, sulfur rich uh, compounds. And when the, the glucosinolate is cleaved, as Matt was saying, by the enzyme from the other cells, um, that glucosinolate rearranges, forms a gas, which acts on the target. Um, <coughs> you get variable glucosinolate uh, profiles and concentrations, but essentially, if you can get the right sort of plant um, with the right profile and concentration, and you can chop it up, access it, apply it to soil, you should get some target suppression of your target organism. Okay. So, with biofumigation, as, as we mentioned, we are focusing on brassicas. And as Bill said, these brassicas have a number of different glucosinolates within them. Now, there are lots, there, there's quite a few options out there in terms of, of biofumigant plants and cultivars and species. So we just want to sort of briefly run through what, what's available to begin with. So we've got some live specimens in there. So the one that's nearest to Bill is this, this crop here. It doesn't really look like, I'm not trying to point at it with my laser pointer. Uh, it doesn't look, look like that very much at the moment, but it soon will be producing yellow flowers. So this is Indian mustard or brown mustard, Brassica juncea. And um, this, this, this is probably the most studied species in terms of biofumigation. It has a very limited glucosinolate profile. Most of uh, the profile is dominated by um, a glucosinolate called synagrid, <coughs> but it does produce an important isothiocyanate called allyl isothiocyanate. And it is important to understand the chemistry of your biofumigation because, because there is there's clear evidence out there that different pests and pathogens are susceptible to um, specific um, isothiocyanates. But there's a lot of work on our isothiocyanate. As you can see there, if you grow it under the right conditions, uh, you can produce quite high biomasses, uh, fresh weights in, in excess of 50 tonnes per hectare. Um, but you do need to have the summer months to grow this. This isn't really a crop for overwintering. It is a crop we would grow during the summer. So typically after crops like winter barley or um, vinyl peas, those types of crops are ideal for that. The chemistry in there is all in the foliage. So we've got to maximise what we do with that foliage in terms of chopping and incorporating. That, that really leads into Bill's work. This is, this is rocket. So we've got some rocket down here uh, with the distinctive white flowers. Um, Rocket, we've, we've had some success with, with Bill's work, um, but not in my work. And that may be the difference between the cultivars used. Um, you focus very much on the, the variety trio, and a lot of work, our work has been on Nina. So there can be these differences, even if you're using a species, differences between varieties. Well, we know that they've got different profiles. So Absolutely. The cultivar that I would use has got phenol, glutes and legs in it, which um, there's a wealth of literature out there to say that phenol glucosinolate um, producing phenol ITC is very nematotoxic, whereas your one, I think the, the profile is quite different. It is, um, it's, it's made up of um, yeah, quite a complex mixture of <coughs> glucosinolates. The one thing to say about rocket, if you have got the, the right chemistry in it, is that it is winter tolerant, so it could be an option for growing over the winter. Number three, this is white mustard, so that's our big tall one there. And um, white mustard often tends to be uh, grown in mixtures. And I've always believed that, that the, the supplier does this because if you look back on the data on myrosinase, which is the enzyme which is important for converting the glucosinolates into the gases, there is around 10 times more myrosinase in white mustard. So this may be why. It's, it's included in mixtures. Number four, this is, this is oil seed radish. So this is this one down here. And they will be growing the same amount of time. So oil seed radish grows, takes a bit longer to mature. 
Uh, five fumigants, typically growing them from anything, if you have the right conditions, from sort of nine weeks up to 14 weeks. Uh, but certainly, obviously, radish, it's needing longer on that scale in order to get uh, maturation. Now, I like Aussie radish for different reasons than I like um, Indian mustard, in that I believe that there's not, there's not an awful lot of chemistry in the foliage which adds to biofumigation. The chemistry is actually in the roots in this crop. Because when you compare the profiles of the two species, we find that Bill mentioned one glucosinolate, uh, two phenol ethyl. Uh, there's more 2 phenol ethyl in the roots of that crop and we found this effect of the growing crops. We believe that's because of the roots. And 26% of, or around 26% of the crops uh, glucosinates come from the roots. These uh, this, uh, Aussie radish certainly <coughs> produce that root biomass. This slide here is what I call um, Matt and Bill's world, really. And it, it, it's, it's just a highlight that the process is incredibly variable. There's, there's lots of factors which affect um, biofumigation success. Now, we can, you can see that we've got the, the growing crop, and the growing crop can be affected by the planting date. That particularly relates to Indian mustard, where it needs to be sown earlier. The species, the cultivar, your mixture, what's, what are you actually growing? It really is important when you buy biofumigant seed <coughs> to find out about the pedigree of where that seed has come from. There's, 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 there has been instances in the past where a lot of stuff is being sold and it might be just condiment mustard. So it's important to find out the, uh, the, the, the history of that seed. Seed rate, um, yes, can be important for certain species. It is, it's less important for Indian mustard. There's some recent work done by the University of Leeds that suggests that actually you can plant much lower than the supplier would suggest, which is probably not too surprising. So you can go down to six kilograms per hectare with Indian <coughs> mustard and still achieve the same amount of biomass and glucosinolate that you would with perhaps something like 10 kilograms per hectare <coughs> of a seed. However, Aussie radish. Have to be a bit more careful because it is sensitive to seed rate reductions. Uh, nitrogen sulfur, um, yes, it is important. We've got to we've got to learn if we want to grow biofumigants, we've got to learn to treat them like crops. They do need a, a, a agronomy with them, crop husbandry, and it does help to give them some nitrogen for biomass reasons. But if you're applying nitrogen in the region of say 100 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen. You do need to include sulphur because there's work that has been done to suggest where um, you have sulphur deficient soils, too much nitrogen, you can actually reduce the glucosinolate content. So applying sulphur in the ratio of 1 to 5 is, is, is useful. Okay, partial biofumigation, what the hell is that? Well, partial biofumigation is something that we've observed at Harper, but it has been observed elsewhere. Partial biofumigation is all to do with the growing crop. We've got plants that are growing, and we know that they leach um, glucosinolates from the roots. However, there's no leaching <coughs> of um, myrosinase. Myrosinase cells are deeper in the, the plant. So where does the myrosinase come from? The myrosinase comes from uh, soil-borne microorganisms, uh, such as aspergillus, bacteria, that are trying to utilise the glucosinolates that are leached as a glucose source, as, as, as Bill alluded to earlier. So during this process, we believe that, that um, we've seen suppression before chopping and incorporation, and uh, we believe that this is, this is to do with these microorganisms. We're, we're continuing to do work on this, but that's, that's what we believe is happening. I'm not going to talk about this, because this is really Bill's area. Um, and that is a very important event, particularly if you're dealing with Indian mustard, and that's the chopping and the incorporation, how to get the best out of it. You've put so much work into growing the crop in the first place. You've got all of your goods that you need to incorporate into soil, your biomass and your glucosinolates. If you get it wrong at the incorporation stage, it can be very costly. So there are other, there is other bits and pieces where you can, you can get biofumigants, um, 
Are these particularly used in other countries? So, so uh, we can pelletize quite a few of the material, add it to the soil, and in the presence of water, we'll get the release of the gases. And in Italy, um, they're also looking at um, liquid-based products, particularly for reducing root knot nematodes and tomatoes. So they, they apply these liquid formulations, which basically consist of a, a vegetable oil and a defected seed meal uh, through trickle irrigation, and uh, we get some biofumigation effects on, from that as well. Okay, I'm going to skim through that. This, we, we are doing various things with, with, with biofumigation, and we're happy to talk to you about that at any point. But these are some of the projects we're involved with. I'm going to show you a little bit of evidence before we go on to Bill's work on some uh, work that uh, my former student, Bruno Ingala, did. Um, and we've got some growers in the audience there that, that helped support uh, Bruno's work. So he, he did a number of different experiments um, to really see, it, to, to understand the seasonality of growing these crops and the effect of different species. Um, so we looked in his work, he looked at Indian mustard, Aussie radish, and uh, <coughs> rocket. He um, also had fallow crops, and we were looking at PCM monitoring, um, pre planting the biofumigants pre-incorporating, post-incorporating, six weeks after incorporation, and this is post-harvest of potatoes, so we have a potato crop in between there. So these are, this is a summary of some of these findings. Um, it's important to, to note in this, some people have played around with biofumics and measured populations by taking soil samples and trying to do population density estimates. There's no inclusion of viability in that in those types of measurements. So what we're really concerned with is measuring viable PCM populations uh, per gram of soil. So we've had to, to produce this data by doing hatching tests and staining uh, to, to allow us to, to come up with these estimates. So what you can see here, the plots pre uh, biofumigants, uh, no significant differences between the plots. Pre-incorporation, this is this really interesting effect we weren't expecting to see. Okay, they're low populations that we're finding a consistent reduction in, in PCM before we've even chopped and incorporated the material. After incorporation, we see, particularly with um, uh, Brassica juncea, an even greater effect. And, and this is the final population after potatoes. So Brassica juncea was coming out um, most favourable in reducing the legacy. This is another experiment which we did. I don't want to over-label uh, uh, what, what we're saying here, but again, this is uh, pre-planting, before incorporation, after incorporation, and the final population. And again, you can see similar effects. We concentrated on just Indian mustard and oilseed radish here. We tried to improve the effect of the oilseed radish by including a fungicide called metconazole, which was used in oilseed rape, which is known to promote rooting. I wish at the time Rufinzar had been available to us because that would have been the one to really focus on. Um, but again, we've seen this effect, we've seen consistent uh, reduction, and then the legacy effect. These are uh, graphs which show correlations between glucosinolate concentration and mortality of PCN in those four different treatments, and you can see this consistent nice trend, increasing glucosinolate, increasing mortality. Okay, I'm not going to talk too much about this one uh, because I want, I want Bill to talk now. I, I, I think I'll talk too long. Um, but what I'd like to just highlight from this particular graph is, is two things really. First of all, um, it's, it's a, it's a an experiment, an in vitro experiment, to look at the extracts from the plants we were working with. So, all seed radish and Indian mustard. It's a dose response, essentially, to those extracts. The one point to notice is this all seed radish effect, in that the leaf extracts are, are having really little effect. In vitro experiments always give you very good, impressive figures. The fact that we're not getting anything from the leaves, this is my Part of my justification is saying the foliage is 
for PCM less important. When you look at the, um, these are glucosinolate contents, when you look at the shoots and the roots um, breakdown for glucosinolates for all seed radish, what we find is they're quite different. The red area where the roots are, you, uh, so in, in total difference there's more glucosinolates, but the red area is all T, B, not E, far. This important <coughs> glucosinolate that um, uh, we put so much uh, precedence on. And that's perhaps the reason why we see these differences. Okay, that's just to highlight we've seen effects in our uh, AHDB work as well. I'm going to hand over to Bill. Okay. Okay. So, <coughs> my work's been um, focused on chopping mustard and incorporating it into soil and then trying to see if uh, methods which I'm using make a difference to PCN uh, viability, basically. Simple as that. Um, this figure up here, um, I've colour coded, so the, the, the far white column was untreated. So what was PCM or Glodera pallida viability when we did nothing? It was about 80%. Then the next column was partial biofumin. Um, so we, we grew a biofumin crop, did nothing to it, what effect did we have? Now Matt was talking about that and he was talking about radish. And, that work quite well, whereas with that one, brown mustard, um, you can see no significant reduction, but there seems to be a little bit of a reduction in the meat, um, but not the main effect. Then we get down to the coloured columns, and the implement combinations that I had, I had a um, flail topper as a macerator versus <coughs> a roll conditioner, so something that's got discs, spin around, cuts the prop long, and puts it through set rolls. So we've basically got something that's been chopped to, you know, that sort of chop length uh, with a flail topper versus a very long residue, but which hopefully has been bruised quite a bit. Those implements were then uh, combined with um, a rotator, which is worth about 15 centimetres uh, incorporation depth, with a plow, so 25, and with a spader, which also had a smear roller in the back. Um, and you can see that regardless of what implement combination we were using, there was no significant difference between the treatments. However, the grey columns, which are all of those incorporation implements combined with the roll conditioner, all have the same mean. Whereas with the blue columns, which were all of those incorporation implements, with the flail topper, there seems to be this steady dropping. And in fact, if you look at the means, there's between a five and a 10% difference between ones that had the roll conditioner and ones that had the flail topper. Now, I couldn't prove that difference in the field, where I had six reps, it's very difficult to prove that sort of difference. But if you can kill 10% more, potentially, with those implement combinations, then that's really quite exciting. I then, um, did a factorial analysis by factor basically. So I said I lumped all of the incorporation implements together and I lumped the maceration implements together and I, I looked to see if there was an important factor. Incorporation, it came out as there was no difference. It didn't matter what incorporation implement you used, but with maceration, there is a difference between um, the flail topper implement and the roll conditioner. Now, that's really good because that means that the more that we master a crop, the more that we break it down, the better effect that we will have. And then if you, if you take that on board, it makes sense that if we were to improve upon the residue which we have generated here, incorporation might become important. Because if we've got a really, really opened up mustard, if you like, this has all been completely pulped, it's releasing more gas, then the soil structure will become important for aiding the gas to move to the target. Um, you know, if we've got a lower bulk density, there's more surface area there, the volatiles can hit the, the target more effectively. And we can see there that with the blue columns, the spader does seem as though it is, it looks to be better than the others, which would make sense because it's a looser soil structure. Which, if we go on to the next slide, so I can't categorically say that, and I want, I'm, my next experiment is going to move on to other types of flare implements, so looking at hammer tines, which should break it apart more. But if we then see the same sort of trend, 
we can say, right, we can do some more work on incorporation. So if you look here, um, the S is the spader, so we're looking at penetrometer resistance data, and you can see that it is there's a significantly looser soil to plow to uh, rotate it, which again fits that sort of trend. So to my mind, um, we know maceration is important, we need to pulp, so a, a fine chop, hopefully with you know, moving on to uh, hammering plants which can improve. Again, uh, forward speed, if we can reduce that, then we should get a finer chop, increase rotor speed again, you know, finer chop. And then looking here, if we can try and incorporate a little bit deeper, potentially we'll get the best effect. So, move on again. <coughs> okay, so uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to get our work published as much as possible in, um, uh, obviously, we're interested in uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications, but we also like to try and speak as much as we possibly can about this because at the end of the day, the only reason we're doing this is to try and improve the industry and to give them advice. And so we do publish in various articles. Uh, so uh, if you haven't seen them, I could happily pass them on. Uh, what was nice recently was that um, our work got some interest from Australia, which is, which is fantastic because um, I got at the home of biofumigation, or one of the homes of biofumigation, so it was nice to see that they were reporting our work in relation to PCM over in Australia. Uh, so so that's, that's everything from us, and of course we'll, we'll take questions, we just want to uh, make acknowledgements uh, to the staff at Harper Adams uh, that, that work on biofumigation, <coughs> growers particularly, uh, we wouldn't get these experiments done if we didn't have the support of, of our growers to, to help us with these experiments and, and for their enthusiasm as, as well. And uh, to acknowledge our sponsors as well to, 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 that funded various projects that we've worked on and um, also to, to mention Bruno who's gone back to uh, Cameroon. Uh, he's got a, a job in one of the universities over there is keen to sort of build links and can continue to work on biofumigation. Just had an email from him yesterday, so uh, uh, I'd like to just sort of acknowledge and thank all of his work as well uh, in, in the process. Thanks very much for, for listening. <coughs>